Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's specialist workshop on zinc in construction and building, hosted by the Africa Desk of the International Zinc Association. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media's Contract Publishing, and I'll be your host this afternoon. Thanks so much to our colleagues at Simena who have once again sponsored the CPD points for the webinar, so registered professional engineers can earn excess CPD points by participating in the webinar. If you didn't submit your EXA registration number when you registered, please be sure to send it after the webinar. Now, before we begin, please be aware that we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post your questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The panelists will answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentations. We are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming it live to YouTube. You can interact with the panelists and other attendees via the chat box, which you'll also find at the bottom of your screen. This is an interactive workshop, so please post your questions for discussion throughout the webinar. And let's get started. Our first speaker this afternoon is Simon Norton. Simon is a corrosion and failure investigation and expert, expert and manages the International Zinc Association in South Africa and Africa. He will provide a brief introduction to zinc and how its chemistry stops the corrosion of steel. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Shannon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, fellow panelists. Terry Smith, Mariana De Brain from Arsenal Metal. Good afternoon to everybody who's online in our webinar, engineers, architects, designers. Welcome to the International Zinc Association's first webinar in 2022. I hope you get great value out of it. We work at the IZA to promote the use of zinc in hot tip galvanizing, continuous galvanizing, which you'll hear about later. And what you won't hear about is we, we also use zinc in fertilizer for grain, in medicines, um, in thermal spraying of zinc for coatings and in zinc rich paints. However, this afternoon our focus is on zinc in construction and building. And before we start and before we go into the greater detail with the two other guest speakers and experts, I'll take you through some zinc chemistry. So I'm just going to set up to share my screen with you now. Right. This is a refresher course in the chemistry of zinc, because our later expert speakers are going to be talking about different applications of coatings and zinc and the use of zinc. The topic I'm going to briefly go into is how does zinc provide corrosion protection to steel? If you look at these two rather contrasting photographs, on the left is a Braithwaite tank. You can see that the steel structure has been hot to galvanize as well as the panels on the tank. On the right hand side, is a beautiful, well, some people would say it's beautiful, it looks lovely, a house where almost everything that's metal has been galvanized. So you can see that galvanizing and the use of zinc to protect against corrosion can be applied both architecturally and in industrial applications. However, let us now go and look at the location of zinc in the chemistry of zinc. The periodic table is one of the most famous layouts and structures in which chemists look at the various elements and as the as the 20th century went on the number of elements in the periodic table expanded and i've located in the table zinc it's uh, sits in the transition metals and just to familiarize you if you look slightly to the left under uh, the column eight you'll see iron next to that co is cobalt then nickel which is utilized in stainless steel. If you go further to the left, under column six, you'll see chromium, CR, and below that, molybdenum. And for instance, combined together, chromium, molybdenum, and nickel, when they're mixed with iron, you of course get various, a form of stainless steel, um, and the chromium and the, and the molybdenum provide the corrosion protection, and the nickel provides another element to stainless steel. But we're not talking about that. We're gonna be speaking about zinc and how does zinc protect steel when applied in galvanizing if we dig a bit deeper into zinc we see that zinc has got an atomic number of 30 now i know engineers are scared of chemistry and i know engineers did a short course in chemistry so we won't scare you too much 
But it is important to know something about zinc. So you'll understand when Terry speaks later and Mariana about other use of the uses of zinc in corrosion protection of steel, why it does its job so well. So its atomic number is 30. That means the zinc atom contains 30 protons and 30 electrons. If you take the atomic weight of 65 and you subtract 30, then you'll find that the nucleus of zinc contains 25 neutrons. If you look on the left-hand side, it says electronic configuration. You'll see in brackets the, 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 uh, the letters AR. That stands for argon. So it's got the underlying structure of argon and then the two other layers or shells, like the onion. If you open an onion, you'll see it's got shells. The 3D shell has got 10 electrons in it, it's full. But the 4S shell isn't full. And the 4S shell has got two electrons which are easily removed. Hence, zinc is easily ionized from zinc naught to zinc plus two. If you look at the bar at the bottom, you'll see physical state at 20 degrees centigrade, it's solid. Its crystal structure is hexagonal. It is amphoteric. And I will speak about that a bit later, which is very important for its properties as a corrosion protector. So this is a rush job, but it'll give you an idea. Now, on a very simple or at a very simple level, if you've got zinc coating carbon steel, so on the left hand side, we've got an anode, the less noble metal, that's zinc. And on the right, we've got carbon steel, which is the cathode, the more noble metal, and the blue material at the top, which I'm now showing you with my pointer, and I'm just going to change my pointer options. That over there is the electrolyte in which the, the carbon steel and the zinc is sitting. And because the zinc goes into solution, it sends electrons to protect the carbon steel, and we call that galvanic protection. The reverse of it is galvanic corrosion. In fact, zinc is sacrificed. And in the chemistry of zinc, we sacrifice the zinc in order to protect the steel. The most important, um, one of the most important tables for you as engineers, specifiers and consultants is what's known as the galvanic series. If you look at the bottom of the series, you'll see graphite, gold, platinum, titanium. Those are cathodic materials, and they are the most noble of the materials that we might work with. One of the things I'd like to point out to you is that if you're working, and we're not talking about galvanizing, but if you're working and assembling a component or designing it, you have to be very careful when you use seals made of graphite, that they actually don't cause corrosion because graphite is very noble and doesn't corrode. But materials that are at the top of the galvanic series as my pointer shows, they easily corrode. So if you combine something at the top here with graphite, then you will find that this material will corrode and the graphite will not. So you have to be very careful. However, that is an aside. We focus on zinc and we put zinc by various methods. Terry Smith will tell you about hot tip galvanizing with zinc. Mariana will tell you about continuous galvanizing with zinc. We put zinc onto steel. And because there's a difference in voltage between the two, and because they're in a different part of the galvanic series, we are able to combine them to protect the steel and sacrifice the zinc. This table has other applications for other types of designs and, and construction. Again, this is a very powerful and useful table where I've highlighted zinc on the left-hand side here with the yellow arrow. And if you combine it with steel with the blue arrow, you'll see that it's shown as red. Now, this is the reverse of what, not the reverse, but this table is used for engineers and designers to make sure that they don't combine two dissimilar metals where one will corrode and collapse and the other one will remain stable. And you could have a catastrophic failure or very rapid corrosion. However, in the case of what we're doing here in hot tip galvanizing and continuous galvanizing, we are combining zinc with carbon steel. We do allow corrosion. We corrode the zinc and we protect the steel. So when you get my presentation later from Crema Media, you'll be able to look at this table and be able to use it regularly 
for your for your applications. It's a very powerful tool, this table. When we delve into the chemistry of zinc, one of the most important things is that zinc, when it's in its form of an oxide, is amphoteric. In other words, it can operate as both a base and an acid. Now, I know engineers haven't done chemistry for years and years, and they last did it at school, or maybe they did it in a rush job in first year at university or college. But it's very important to understand this. If you ever look at this table that I've showed you, this reaction, you'll see that zinc oxide operating as a base, the S in brackets means solid, reacts with hydrochloric acid, HCl, in brackets AQ means aqueous, means in solution, is an acid. Now, the old, um, we used to learn this at school, that an acid plus a base gives you salt plus water. So an acid, an acid plus a base gives you salt plus water. So in this reaction, zinc oxide operates as a base and it forms zinc chloride and water. So you've now got to be really on the alert because this is very important to the use of hot galvanizing in field applications. I won't go much deeper than, than that and Terry will deal with it. On the other hand, zinc oxide can also be an acid. So in this case, zinc oxide, solid S, reacts with sodium hydroxide in solution, aqueous, which is the base, and an acid plus a base gives you salt plus water. And here you have the salt that's formed. So what you have to be very aware of is that when you're using zinc, galvanized material or continuously galvanized material, you must make sure that it's never immersed in either a very basic or a very acid situation, because then it will start to react and corrode very, very quickly. So you might not achieve the life you're actually hoping to achieve. Now, today we're going to be looking at how zinc works in the protection of steel, structural steel in buildings, architectural steel on facades, atmospherically exposed steel in pylons, electrical pylons, masts, gantries, poles, cell phone towers, other towers, cranes, roofing and cladding of buildings, fasteners, bolts and nuts. Mariana is going to be talking about continuous galvanizing, which is the roofing and the cladding and so on. Terry is going to be talking about most of the rest in as little in, in the time that he has available. And then we can deal with queries from people in detail afterwards. But all of this is by means of galvanizing and all of the galvanizing is done with zinc. So it's critical to understand why zinc does what it does and the chemistry of zinc. Now, very few people realize that galvanized materials can be used in the most beautiful two photographs. Both of these buildings are clad with galvanized material. It's superb and it's absolutely beautiful. So from an architectural perspective, you can actually use galvanized material or zinc coated material to cover a building and clad it and make it extremely attractive. Or you can use it in what I call rough and tough industrial environments, rough and tough mining environments. Here's a rough and tough industrial environment on the left hand photograph. Uh, the, um, somebody's measuring the amount of galvanizing or the coating thickness on a galvanized item using a coating thickness gauge. And on the right is structural steel, which has been galvanized. This is a rough and tough environment. We won't be dealing with reinforcing steel on this webinar. We will in another one in July, but you can also hot tip galvanize or use zinc to protect rebar against corrosion. So what is the electrochemistry of the corrosion of, of steel in water? If you imagine in this photograph or this, sorry, this drawing, this representation that this is a piece of reinforcing steel or piece of steel in water, you will see that an anode and cathodes form all over the steel. And what actually happens is that the iron goes from the state iron naught to iron plus two, where my little marker is, and it generates four electrons because we're taking two iron atoms, producing two iron ions, I-O-N-S, iron plus two. And this is known as ferrous, the ferrous iron, F-E-R-R-O-U-S. If it was F-E plus three, it would be the ferric iron. So iron goes into solution, four electrons created. Those four electrons go across here and they reduce oxygen and water. So if you want to stop corrosion, you've either got to stop this reaction here, 
or stop that reaction there. And there are various ways of doing it. And one of them is galvanizing. So what happens here is iron goes into the solution into water. Your piece of steel starts to fall apart. The iron reacts with the hydroxide iron OH- minus to form iron hydroxide and iron oxides, and you get rust. Very, there are various forms of rust, and there are various structures for it. So here you have the anode. There you have the cathode. Reduction takes place at the cathode where, where electrons are added. So there's reduction at the cathode. Oxidation takes place at the anode. Electrons are lost. And you get these cells all over the structure in water. If you want to stop it, you must stop this reaction or stop that reaction. And that's where galvanizing comes into play. Now, let's look at the chemical impact of the atmosphere on galvanized steel. Example, zinc-coated steel. Uh, that could be exposed, hot tip galvanized steel, roof sheeting that's not got an organic coating on it, pre-galv gutters, light metal structures that aren't painted, and cladding and roofing. This is probably the latest thinking on the corrosion of zinc. It's developed by two Swedish scientists, and it uses a particular um, technique called the Gilders formulation. Let's start on the right-hand side of this where my cursor is moving around, and let's go to gas. That's the atmosphere where you are. If you're outside in the outdoors atmosphere, you're going to be exposed to oxygen, some moisture in the atmosphere. If you're at the sea, because we're in a marine environment, there'll be sodium chloride, there'll be sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide, CO2. Then there's an interface between our galvanized steel and there's <coughs> liquid on the surface. And so you'll get hydroxide ions, hydrogen ions, because water dissociates into OH minus and H plus. Sodium chloride, when it's salt, it's salt, like table salt. When it mixes with water, it dissociates into the chloride ion and the sodium ion. Sulfate, sulf, sulfur dioxide from the atmosphere also does that, and it falls into SO, SO4 minus two, and so does carbon dioxide. All of those now are deposited or come into contact in the liquid level on the surface of the galvanizer. Now, if we move over onto the left-hand side, here is our galvanized item, steel, carbon steel with zinc on it. It comes out and is exposed to the atmosphere at a marine environment. It starts to form zinc oxide and zinc hydroxide. Then shortly afterwards, it starts reacting with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which I showed you on the right and it forms zinc carbonate, hydroxide. Then it comes into contact with the chloride ions and it starts forming this compound over here. And finally, it picks up the sodium from the sodium chloride and forms that compound there. So these compounds that you see here start to form as a deposition on the surface of your galvanized material. Underneath that is what I showed you in the previous visual, there is our cathodes and anodes on the surface, and then underneath is your galvanized material. So this is known as the Gilders on the right here, Gilders formulation that was, that was utilized by Wallinder and Leichraff when they published their research work on the latest thinking and um, uh, chemistry of the corrosion or the reactions of zinc when exposed to a marine environment. <clears throat> now, if it's if something is exposed to an atmospheric environment under sheltered conditions, and it's exposed to either sulfur pollution, say in sulfur dioxide near coal-fired power plants, of course, many of these are now closed down around the world, but it still could happen that refineries could have sulfur-containing emissions, although in most European and North American cities, that's disappeared. But if you've got chloride, pollution isn't really the right word, but it's a chlorides in the atmosphere, so Durban, the bluff, Cape Town Harbour, False Bay Coast in Cape Town, the west coast of South Africa and Namibia, then you have this option at the bottom of this diagram. So if you take the, the, the timeline that I've shown here on the x-axis, you'll see seconds, hours, days, weeks, months, years. You first get zinc oxide hydroxide forming on the surface of your galvanized roof if it isn't painted or on your galvanized steel if it's exposed to the atmosphere and hasn't been either protected or passivated. Then zinc carbonate hydroxide forms. 
The next stage is if you are in a sulfur dioxide, sulfur polluted area away from the sea, then you'll have the top reactions occurring. If you are near the sea, you'll have the bottom reactions occurring. And you can see that these reactions occur, all of this occurs within weeks of being galvanized. This here occurs later um, and is in months and years. So understanding these two dynamics helps you to understand where to apply hot to galvanized materials. So if you're at the coast, you have to do it. If you're down a mine and it's got sulfur compounds or chlorides, you need to galvanize and then maybe even coat it. But Terry will talk more about that. So how does galvanizing and the zinc chemistry work when paint can perhaps fail? Well, if you look at the left-hand diagram, you'll see there's a zinc coating, the steel underneath, the zinc is the anode, the steel is the cathode, and we've made a scratch in the galvanizing. There's a scratch, damage in the, the zinc coating on the steel. Now, remember, this coating is not like paint. It's not just something that is mechanically adhering to the surface of the steel. And Terry will talk about that. It's actually a series of four iron zinc alloys that are formed on the surface if it's hot tip galvanizing, and it's slightly different if it's continuous. So over here, the zinc, as I showed you in the previous visual, let's see if I can go back to it. The zinc forms these compounds over here. And as it does that, it fills up this gap. So zinc provides a barrier against the atmosphere to the underlying steel, and it acts in a galvanic or electrochemical manner to protect steel. So you've got protective material. On the other hand, if you only paint your steel, when the paint is scratched, there is no further protection for the steel. There's no galvanic protection and there's no deposit formation here. So the steel corrodes, lifts the paint and your system fails. Quite obviously, the moral of the story is galvanize your steel. So in summary, when you apply a galvanized coating to galvanized steel, there's your underlying steel, it firstly provides a barrier against the corrosive materials in the atmosphere, a physical barrier. And secondly, it provides galvanic protection to damage in the coating. The zinc is sacrificed into solution. The electrons are then used to settle the um, electrochemical or the, we call this the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. There's a thermodynamic equilibrium that has to be kept balanced. And these electrons then provide that thermodynamic equilibrium. So in summary, when the going gets tough, the tough get galvanizing. If you've got a mine, a deep mine, a coal mine, or a platinum group minerals mine, you need to galvanize your steel. If you look on the left-hand side, and we've got this available for you, if you need to fight corrosion, you need to use continuously galvanized sheet that's been continuously galvanized with zinc. And if you're at the coast or near the sea, you have to galvanize. You can't afford to put your structures at risk. And if you want it to last for a long time, there's only one choice, and that's hot tip galvanized steel. As I said to you before, when the tough get going, when the going, sorry, gets tough, the tough get galvanizing. And the chemistry of zinc is absolutely vital to all of this. And you will see it now exposed and explained by our speakers, Mariana from Astro Metal and Firsty Smith, who is an independent expert consulting on galvanizing. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be around during the rest of the symposium and the seminar and the webinar. If there are any questions, please ask. If there are more detailed questions, we can deal with it afterwards. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, um, Simon. Uh, it was really interesting, especially for someone um, like me who doesn't know anything about um, chemicals. <laughs> um, so now before I hand over to our next speaker, I'd like to find out from our attendees whether you include zinc-based coatings in your designs and specifications for projects. So please have a look at the poll that will be on your screen soon and let us know your thoughts. Um, I'm going to launch it now, so you should be able to see the poll now. 
Um, there are two questions here. So the first one is, do you include zinc-based coatings in your designs and specifications for projects? You can just mention yes or no there. And then the second question we'd like to know is, tell us where you've seen the most success with zinc coatings. Is it in galvanizing in building projects or at the seaside or down a mine or in manufacturing plants or on exposed steel on a building? Um, if you mentioned other, perhaps you can put that in the, in the chat so we can see what those other um, what those other choices are. Um, thank you very much to everyone who is voting. I see we've got quite a few coming in. So far, we've got a very good 90% um, so far on people saying, yes, they do include zinc-based coatings in their designs and specifications. Um, I'm sure Simon and the International Zinc Association will be very happy to hear that. Um, I'll let this Paul, just continue for a few more seconds. Give everyone a chance to answer. It looks like everyone's taking some time to look at that. Thank you for participating. These, in, these answers are always quite interesting. Right, I'm gonna end this poll now and then let's see what the results looked like. I'm gonna share the results now. You should be able to see them. We have 91% of our attendees who voted saying that they do include zinc-based coatings in their designs and specifications. Simon, I'm sure you're happy to hear that. And then with our second option, it would seem that majority of people, 52% say that they have seen the most success with zinc coatings at the seaside. Simon, is there anything you'd like to mention about that? Just make sure you're unmuted, yeah. No, I'm running on that. Thank you very much everybody for responding so quickly. Um, uh, Shannon, Shannon, I think you need to maybe have given them a little bit extra time there, but nevertheless, it's very interesting to see that um, quite a lot of people have seen success in building projects. Um, I'd be interested to know whether the people who worked with it at the seaside have nearly observed it or actually have included it um, in their own projects and their own operations. I also see quite a number of members of the South African Navy uh, who are participating in this webinar. Um, and I'll be presenting a corrosion um, seminar at the South African Navy shortly. Um, and I'd be interested to know where they use galvanizing or zinc coatings. Um, I see also mining people here. And Terry, you must comment on this because you've got more experience down a mine than I have. And Mariana, maybe you have as well. Um, and then manufacturing plants, I'd be fascinated to know from notes on the chat who's used it in a manufacturing plant and where. So thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing that poll. Um, thank you to everybody who participated. Um, let's move back to our, to our presentation. So um, we're moving on now, and I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Terry Smith. Terry is a specialist on hot dip galvanizing and its application to steel structures in construction and building. He will discuss hot dip galvanizing in construction, specifically focusing on bolts, facades, and structural steel. He'll give an overview of the ins and outs of hot dip galvanizing within these aspects of construction. Over to you, Terry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um... Um, I do see that my internet is unstable at this moment in time. So if I wave away, uh, please uh, shoot with a, a question that we can go back to that particular point. Um, what we aim to discuss uh, are the following things. Um, uh, introduction, specifying correctly, coating thickness equals coating life, coating thickness influences, a few case histories, as well as a duplex coating, a duplex coating case history and old coatings, which give you surprising uh, durability. So what is hot dip galvanizing? Hot dip galvanizing takes place when uh, correctly uh, clean steel is dipped into a bath of zinc at about 450 degrees C. Um, when, when the steel gets to a temperature of 450 degrees C, a metallurgic reaction takes place. Um, which um, forms an abrasion-resistant control barrier that will uh, provide a maintenance-free lifespan of in excess of 50 odd years. Why hot dip galvanize? Unless steel is protected, it will corrode in most environments, slowly returning 
awakening to its natural state. A barrier such as galvanizing or suitable paint is applied for corrosion control. Unlike paint, zinc and its alloys from a hot tip galvanizing are metallurgically bonded, a barrier coat that's been around for quite a long time, 185 years. Um, there's a micrograph of a typical uh, general hot tip galvanized coating and you can see at the bottom i don't know if you can see my 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 uh, 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 error there's a steel base and that's the hardness of steel and uh yeah we have the iron zinc alloys and you can see the iron zinc alloys are harder than steel so that's where the abrasion resistance comes in um, and then most times it is overcoated with a pure zinc layer on the outside surface these are known as iron zinc alloys and in most and in, in, in many instances they provide at least 30% better protection than a pure zinc layer. Thickness for thickness. Zinc is also cathodic to steel. So it scratches uh, of about up to three millimeter. As Simon mentioned, the zinc will sacrifice in preference to the, to the steel itself. And yeah, you can see the galvanic series, which Simon had his, his galvanic series was opposite weight ground. Uh, my my electropositive materials are at the top top and my electronegative materials at the bottom. But yeah, you can see zinc and carbon steel. And as Simon said, zinc will preferentially corrode in favor of carbon steel when the coating gets damaged. So, um, and that's called the galvanic series. And then this is based on the corrosion cell, which is largely uh, taking the galvanic series in use, um, where we have a bit of zinc, uh, which is the anode. Uh, we have a piece of steel, which is the cathode. Uh, we link them with the electrical uh, component and we have electrolyte and we have four items here which comprise the corrosion cell take away one of these items and you stop corrosion so yeah you can see the zinc is preferentially corroding in favor of the steel because of the electrolyte so corrosion creep in terms of hot tip galvanized layer is impossible and yeah, you can see a mechanically damaged coating which is uh, about th almost three kilometers is down into a gold mine after seven years and we've scratched it and there's no corrosion uh, creep whatsoever. Why hot tip galvanize? Um, inspection is easy. Coating thickness and continuity, continuity are important. Um, yeah, you can see just taking coating thickness readings by inspector. The process is extremely quick. There's no curing time. Once cooled, components can be inspected and loaded, and now you can see they'll be loaded on a truck. Um, that's an honest coating. Uh, we uh, we call that honest. Um, if the steel is not clean, it will not galvanize. Whereas generally, with with the other organic coatings, you can paint over contaminants and have a failure. Yeah, you can see some weld slag and uh, demarcations on steel, which obviously wasn't removed prior to galvanizing, and it comes out as uh, marks. The edges are also well protected, differently to paint, where paint actually thins out on these edges and a good paint specification would call for a stripe coat, hot tip galvanizing as an equal coating thickness around edges. Comparing types of hot tip galvanizing, uh, you get continuous sheet, um, which is galvanized to these standards, 4998, which is for structural grades, and 3575, which is commercial grades. And this is basically the configuration, and I think Mariana will actually talk a little bit, but essentially think, uh, the steel is decoiled, it goes through a welding area, through this entry loop, it goes through a kneeling furnace, which is about 900 degrees C, it runs down into the zinc bath at about 100 to 140 meters a minute, and as it comes through these gas or air knives, the coating gets wiped off to a particular grade um, of coating, which is available and then obviously gets coiled or coated over, as she will talk about. Then general hot tip galvanizing, which is done to SANS 121, which is based on the ISO 1461. There yeah, you can see a pretty, a pretty example of the process. The cleaning process comprises uh, the items are jigged, and they go into a degreasing bath, then it goes into a rinse bath, from there it goes into acid, acid bars and various number of acid bars that the galvanizers have goes into a rinse bath again, and then into a flux bath. And from the flux bath, it goes into the zinc uh, drying deck where it actually uh, gets cool. 
and then into the zinc bath where the reaction takes place. And finally, it comes out and it goes into a quench, which has normally got some type of product to passivate the surface, which Simon mentioned, and then it is inspected and cleaned. When you use a centrifuge hot tip galvanizing, which is done to the same standard or this particular standard, which is 10684, uh, um, goes through the same process. Um, they get uh, into a drying deck um, and then into a basket loading and the basket goes into the zinc bath. Afterwards, it goes into a centrifuge, which rapidly spins and quickly breaks. And yeah, you can see a, a fairly modern uh, plant and then ultimately it is inspected and, and uh, looked at. So the life, and this is something that I keep on saying, life is of a metallic zinc coating is proportional to its thickness. Specifying correctly, general versus continuous. They're both in the specification are both hot tip galvanized coatings. And there are sometimes very different um, uh, uh, ideas on what these are. Um, this MSG was, by the way, I walked into a consulting engineer's office many years ago, um, and he was proud to show me on his drawing uh, that he specified hot tip galvanized. And I said, what is the MSG? And he said to me, that's mild steel galvanized. Now, in my experience, uh, you, you get what you specify. So elaborate specifications make a huge difference in getting what you really require. This is the general hot tip galvanizing standard, which is SANS 121, typically um, showing you the, the, the category of metals in terms of thickness, the local coating thickness, and the mean coating thickness. And what I've chosen here is a, a, a three to less than six millimeter, um, because a lot of purlins are either hot tip galvanized general, or they elect, uh, 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 made from continuous hot tip galvanizing. So just a comparison in terms of 55 microns and a mean of 70, um, yeah, you can see in a typical building versus continuous galvanizing. And I'm certainly not knocking continuous hot tip galvanizing because it's really up to you in terms of your specification. But yeah, you can see a Z275, the, the local average coating thickness, the 275, and I'll explain that in the next slide, is around about 19 microns, and the minimum is about 13 and a half. And that's often used with uh, purlins or otherwise sheeting, like you see in the picture. Coating thickness, coating life. Here we can see continuous hot tip galvanized sheeting. There's a range of sh available uh, sheets from a Z100 uh, to Z700. In fact, we've seen things go down to Z60, which is very, very lightly coated. So be very careful um, um, that, and obviously OcelotMetal, I don't think produces Z60. Maybe Mariana can answer that question when she gets up. But looking at 275, Z275, in order to equate micron thickness, you take 275 microns or grams per square meter. You divide it by two, which is the two sides and you divide that again by 7.21, which is SG of zinc, you get a normal coating thickness of about 19 microns. And similarly, when a Z100, um, the coating thickness is about 6.9 odd. However, there is some small, specific, small writing in the specifications and the minimum coating thickness uh, equals 40% of the individual value, which is in a Z275, is 275 micron, 275 grams per square meter. So if you, you, you divide that by seven, um, it gives you uh, roughly about 13 and a half microns. And yet you can see a typical micrograph of a continuous hot tip galvanized coating, uh, very no iron zinc alloys. And the reason for that is because obviously sheeting has to be ductile to create the S rib or IBR shape that one makes from it. Okay, specifying correctly with fasteners, uh, hot tip galvanized versus zinc electroplated. Both are called hot uh, galvanized in many dealers. And yeah, you can see these um, uh, packages in a well-known uh, chain store, galvanized and galvanized chain. Um, but their performance is very, very different in terms of corrosion control. Yeah, you can see an example, there's zinc electroplated bolts with a hot tip galvanized structure, and he has a hot tip galvanized bolts after years of exposure. <clears throat> 
zinc electroplated protein thickness are generally between below 15 microns. And if you look in the following slides, yeah, you can see this in the underground environment, 10.8 microns. The coating, the, the installation was relatively new. Uh, he has one of 15.9 and he has one of about 11 microns. And then there's a common gate latch, which often gets known as galvanized, put on a hot tip galvanized gate. And you can see the corrosion of the gate latch far sooner than the actual gate itself. Whereas hot tip galvanizing on fasteners in accordance with ISO 10684 is somewhat thicker. And here you can see the coating thickness on a hot tip galvanized nut, 131 microns. Uh, he has the flat washer, 170 microns. And here again is another nut at about 86 microns. Foundation uh, holding down bolts and thread rod are also available in hot tip galvanized form. And you can see there are specialist guys that actually make up these bolts and they are available. Um, yeah, you can see threaded rod. Be careful of threaded rod because often they are zinc electroplated, particularly if they're up to three meters long. But three meter long, hot tip galvanized, and usually one meter long threaded hot tip galvanized uh, rod are available. Most important, order to the specification, but order timelessly. Why do I say that? Is because Quite often when a, a project comes out, the first thing the fabricator does is make up the steel, he gets it hot to galvanize, and at the very last minute, when he moves on to site, he starts uh, looking to buy the bolts. And quite often those bolts are not available as a standard item, and they have to be done, and usually the bolts are fabricated up in Johannesburg, and are galvanized up there, and particularly if on the coast, you wait quite a long time to that, to receive them. Um, we, when I was with the Hot Tip Governors Association, we started um, a, a supply program where we had a, a, a bolt friendly guys along the coast that were stocking Hot Tip Governors. And now I'm not quite sure what the situation is, but really uh, order your bolts uh, timelessly uh, before the project starts. Coating, coating. Life in terms of the environment, in terms of these three specifications, they all have a, a corrosion category, a, a graph like this. Um, we're looking at um, we're looking at C3 and C5, C3 atmosphere. You can see the corrosion rate of zinc is about 0.5 uh, to 2 microns, and that's probably 90% of the country. We're looking at the typical life of of a Z275 around about 10 to 40 years and in a, um, uh, on a 70 micron hot tip galvanized coating about 35 to greater than 50 years. In a C5 environment, which I'll show you this now, uh, particularly on the coast and not all parts of the coast are C5 by the way, the corrosion rate is about four to eight microns a year. So Z275 would last about three to five years and a 70 micron coating would last you about nine to 18 years. <clears throat> okay, so the major coating thickness uh, and appearance influences of hot, general hot tip galvanizing uh, are these, uh, not entirely controlled by the galvanizer, which have a big effect. The steel composition, we'll talk a little bit about this in style. The steel thickness, you can see on the specification, the thicker the steel, generally the thicker the coating, and the surface roughness, generally if it's uh, quite rusted or abrasively bastard, it will attract a, a further coating thickness. What's, what, what's not controlled by the galvanizer uh, or can be controlled by the galvanizer is the zinc temperature. You can play with that, although he doesn't really do that because it influences his productivity. Um, the immersion time, generally it goes in as quick as possible and emerges very slowly. Withdrawal rate is very slow. The angle of exit and then the alloy additions, which uh, primarily is uh, zinc, uh, a little bit of aluminium. We can add other things like nickel and tin to actually give us more aesthetic look type of coating. Steel composition, the biggest influence, which we'll talk about. So silicon and aluminium is used for deoxidizing agents in molten metal. Um, and uh, you generally get a silicon kill steel or an aluminium kill steel. Um, certain levels of silicon in the, in the steel have a major influence on coating thickness. And here we have what they call the, the Sandlin curve. And uh, Yaz at the bottom, uh, bottom of the graph, you can see between 0.0 and 
0.45% uh, uh, silicon and about 0.08% at 450 degrees C, which is the temperature of galvanizing. You can see the reaction, which is really a very thick coating. So we try and aim for steel between 0.15 and 0.25 uh, in terms of silicon. And then also phosphorus. Phosphorus is not added to the steel. It depends on where it's mined in this country. And um, when you have a too high a phosphorus rate, you can have delamination like this in your steel. So ideal steel, silicon, ideally between 0.15 and 0.25%, and phosphorus less than 0.02%. Okay, here's a case history. I call it negative to positive. Um, it's on uh, freeway sign gantries. Excuse me a second. Um, the sign gantries are starting to be hot tip galvanized after about 20 years of marketing to various organizations, including Sandro. So yeah, we have some that's come down. This is the fabrication of it. You can see it's a, a box section. And obviously, because the zinc has got to flow through, you can see there's various big holes and things that actually allow the zinc to flow through. Um, yeah, you can see these things were galvanized in a galvanizing bath. So it looked quite good. And what we did find, it was quite a reactive steel. And that's a typical coating thickness increase. This is two steels welded together. There you can see 187 microns on the other side, 420. So that steel is a lot more uh, uh, reactive. This is not the steel that we're talking about though. But we did have in this steel work on these uh, sign gantries, the phosphorus content, which was way over the maximum amount. And we had flaky like this. And obviously now you've got all these gantries that have been fabricated. What do you do? You can either zinc metal spray them uh, or alternatively and or maybe paint them. So what we decided to do, which is not normally the case, abrasive blasting is not necessary prior to hot tip galvanizing. We don't have to abrasive blast steel unless there's specific reasons. So we decided to abrasively blast all the fabricated gantry steel components, um, providing a mechanical key in addition to the me uh, metallurgical key. We knew that the resulting coating thickness would be excessive the result was a thick, a uniform coating, but tenacious and not flaking. And may in time result in what they call as bronzing, but will provide in excess of 50 years of service life. And this, uh, these gantries can be seen uh, down the R300. Uh, you can see the dark color that we have here. They are ready up for probably about, uh, probably seven or eight years already. And you can see there's a bit of discoloration at the where the joints are welded, and that's using a zinc rich paint. So the coating thickness ranged from about 450 microns to 700 microns. And that, if you look at the specification, is way beyond that. So what we're expecting maybe in years to come, that bronzing might happen. The, the iron zinc alloys, because the iron in the coating starts corroding, and um, although it's not corroding, it becomes, it leaves a surface called bronzing. And yeah, you can some see a light pole, which is down near Tigerberg Hospital, and these light poles are bronzing. And you can see, taking off the contaminants on the surface, the coating thickness is still way above the specification of what is originally called for. And these, these light paths are probably about 40 years old. And you can see further coating thickness readings. And there's in comparison to the pure galvanizing on the outside. Okay, here's another case history. Uh, this is this is Morlington High School uh, AstroTurf uh, perimeter fence. Um, <clears throat> the original specification required hot tip galvanizing plus three coat paint system. Also required was a 25 year warranty. So the assessment of hot tip galvanized components in the vicinity of the school was necessary. Um, um, and why did that is because I wanted to make sure that um, the three coat paint system was necessary. Hot tip galvanizing alone would provide 25 years and I'll tell you how we, uh, we came upon that result. The assessment of these components was adjacent to Whitbridge Island and other things in the school area. Now you can see a typical map of the area. Uh, there's the high, the high school, Millington. this is the southeast direction, and yeah, you can see this is um, Woodbeach Island, where the wooden bridge is across the uh, thing. So the aggressive southeast blow 
goes from this side. It doesn't come from the sea itself. So this coastal atmosphere is not as aggressive as along the Fosbo coast. So here's my first uh, um, exhibit. This is a light pole, which is probably about three, 400 meters away from the sea. The sea's right there. Uh, I was speaking to the lady while I was taking coating thickness readings, and she told me it was about 18 years old. Yeah, you can see the coating thickness um, that uh, we have. So this is still way above the specification, even though it was 18 years old. Um, yeah, we can see uh, further coating thickness readings. There's a couple of light poles in the area. Um, yes, yeah, some more. And there's the typical coating thickness readings that I achieved on various things. You can see a lot of these are hot tip galvanized. And I wondered why they weren't duplex coating these as the consultant had asked for in his project. Even the bolts, uh, there's an electroplated bolt and there's a hot tip galvanized bolt on the wooden bridge looking pretty good after a number of years. So what was the final, final um, results was this, because the custodian of the school showed me an old uh, um, a grandstand, which he said was about 23 years old. And I thought, well, that's great. Now we can actually assess the galvanizing. You can see the, the, the bolts are starting to corrode, but the galvanizing is fine. And I, I cleaned off areas on the surface uh, and measured the coating. And you can see the coating thickness was it was about 80 odd microns, uh, yeah, it was 93, and yeah, it was another 87. So the coating was still well beyond what the specification called for originally, it was 23 years old. So the cost okay. of uh, duplexing was not necessary, yeah. I yes? just wanted to let you know there's five minutes to go. Okay, yes, great. This was the AstroTurf, uh, um, which was ultimately only galvanized. You can see a couple of the coating thickness readings that we did. All the coating thickness readings were greater than the specification called for. Typically, um, they also did uh, ask for galvanized bolts. And yeah, you can see electroplated bolts, which are 10.4 and 3.8. And those were, those were interchanged with a hot tip galvanized bolt for this particular thing. And there's the coating thickness of 138 and 194. That's the school itself because we did an assessment and the, the consultant and wanted to ensure that uh, the, the things would look good. And we did these reference areas on the, on the fences so that we can actually uh, uh, monitor the finish. This is uh, colliery overhand uh, conveyors, um, which I just want to show you. Um, this is Douglas Colliery. They're about 36 years old. And after 20 years, we did this inspection now you can see the typical things this is these gantries are up to 22 two meter, uh, kilometers long um, and yes some coating thickness readings uh, that we taken at about 200 different places along the um, uh, conveyor uh, yes um, the spur wing building down in capricorn park you can see very aggressive conditions down here, the southeast of Blosin, you have high wave action and up to three, three and a half kilometers away from the sea, the corrosion rate of zinc is about eight and a half microns per year. So he has a building which was erected there. Everything was supposed to be hot tip galvanized, um, but they use Z275 continuous hot tip galvanizing for all their purlins and they use hot tip galvanized with general galvanizing with all their rafters and bracing. So this is the original uh, 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 purlins, which was originally 19 odd microns, and now down to about five and a half microns and areas we had red rust. And on the general hot tip galvanizing, we still had 160 odd microns. Obviously, uh, to stop prevention, this white corrosion product, which Simon mentioned, ideally this should be painted and not only sent in hot tip galvanized. Three years in a C5 marine environment and all these burdens had to be replaced. Deep layer coating systems, painting hot tip galvanized for color and enhanced corrosion protection, adding appropriate durable top coats, which ideally correctly prepared, uh, will increase its life. Um, preparation is extremely important and ideally the passivation stage should be uh, excluded. And yeah, you can see some examples. He has a duplex coated uh, uh, um, example. Uh, this is the um, transfer tower at Khuriup, uh, a coal washing plant. Yeah, you can see the surface full of coal ash. 
Um, and here you see the coating thickness where we destroy the paint coating to actually measure the galvanizing. And here's the uh, paint overall coating thickness. This is now about 30 years old. So it's still looking good. Surprisingly, durability in terms of old things, most situations hot tip galvanizing is a slowly corroding coating. Using a brazier paper, comprehensively clean all the surface contaminants. Once removed, residual coating can now be assessed. So yeah, you can see a number of these things where we've cleaned them, took coating, thickness reading, and surprisingly, there is a great amount of coating left. Yeah, you can see, that including, I measured over the marine contaminant, which is 213 microns, and then removed it, and there were 62 microns left. A typical good example of this, if you have uh, want to check uh, the corrosion rate of steel uh, or galvanizing, you often find these um, sign, signs which have a date on, and you can assess that in terms of um, how when it was installed. Thank you for listening. I have three more slides, so that, but I won't do those ones. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. I'm sorry to rush you like that. I just no don't want to run out of time for Mariana. <laughs> but thanks very much for that very informative presentation on hot dip galvanizing and construction. I, for one, found it very fascinating. A reminder to our audience to send us any questions um, that you'd like to ask the panelists, and then we will answer those at the end of the presentations. Now, finally, our final guest is Mariana Debrain. She is the product manager for Galvanized Sheet at ArcelorMittal South Africa. Mariana started her career at ArcelorMittal in 1991 as a metallurgical engineering student. For the first 10 years of her career, she was involved in product technology and was responsible for galvanized products. At present, she is product manager and focuses on product development for automotive, cold rolled, as well as galvanized and color coated products. Mariana will take a detailed look at galvanized coated steel sheet for construction, specifically focusing on roofing and cladding. Over to you, Mariana. Thank you, Shannon. And um, thank you also for Terry and, and Simon to giving the very scientific and very good uh, background so that I can focus a bit more on the uh, practical applications of uh, galvanized products for roofing. Um, just quickly share my presentation. So, um, as I said, we are on a, we do a continuous galvanizing uh, where we achieve a bit of a lower coating than the uh, autop galvanizing uh, that Terry mentioned. And the roofing, when one looks at or thinks about roofing and cladding, this is what typically comes out about. Nice uh, colored roofs, galvanized roofs, cladding for industrial buildings. So steel or in galvanized steel is a very versatile product and we can use in a very wide range of applications. Um, something that one sometimes also forget about in roofing is, um, or let's say, uh, in sync for construction and so on, is also the light steel framing um, association where you have um, also galvanized products with that you can use there and um, roof trusses, all of the type of things. All of this um, finds a very good application with continuous galvanized steel. I just, um, okay, let me, sorry. I'm just uh, thinking. Um, so just a bit of a quick recap on how sink protects, uh, as Simon mentioned, uh, there is two uh, functions or um, ways. It's a barrier protection where the sink um, separates, creates a separate layer between the environment and the steel underneath, and it protects in that way. Uh, the second way is our galvanic protection, where the sink itself is um, preferentially corroded or it sacrifices itself to protect the um, less reactive uh, steel. So uh, sink in that way, for example, has a very good protection on cut edges or scratches where um, it um, will sacrifice itself until there is no sink left. And then in such way, um, keeping the steel uh, to, 
that it lasts longer. So you will see here, um, as you can see here on, a, on, a, on this picture in the, let me just quickly put interruptions. In this picture, when you have a cut edge, um, the sink smears partially, and then it is a protected then, um, protects that cut edge. And that extends the lifetime of the steel. Um, One big issue that you could have with uh, steel sheeting uh, is um, wet storage correction. Or, uh, so that is where your normal sink reaction that takes place, that you would want it uh, to take place, where it um, forms that layer of protective uh, sink carbonate. When you have a normal uh, cycle, it forms first a sink hydrocyte, and then um, when it's in contact with the air, it forms a zinc carbonate and it forms a protective layer. If that cycle does not take place, then you will get excessive um, corrosion. And this white rust that you can see in this picture. So it's very important that uh, when you are uh, having uh, sheeting, roof sheeting, for example, and it's stored before use and all that, that it is must be kept dry at all moments, during transport, during storage, maybe on site, things like that, so that um, this doesn't happen. It's uh, even, um, let's say, even more aggressive uh, if you have a longer time of exposed uh, sheeting, if in high temperatures, or also you, if you have uh, contaminants in the air like chlorine salts and so on, will accelerate this type of reactions. When specifying sink, and as Steri uh, showed also in a lot of, uh, of his examples, the sink coating thickness is direct related to how long this will protect the material. And depending on a certain of environments, dry conditions, um, up to urban or coastal areas, you will have a certain rate of corrosion. And sink will, um, you have to specify the correct coating for the correct environment. Um, you can see here, uh, there, uh, zinc coat is, uh, we supply around from Z60 to Z600. There is a very wide range of coating, so it's not only for roofing and cladding, but sometimes you want to have a, a, you just want to have some temporary shelter or temporary uh, corrosion protection. So then you will go for cheap uh, and thin coatings, that of course is not recommended when you will have a proper building, roofing and cladding, where you want it to bit, last a bit longer. And um, you can see here the, the uh, thing, uh, thin coating thickness for each of the different uh, coating weights that are uh, available in South Africa. And also the type of time that you will last. So why I say it's very important specifying, for example, I have the case that um, People wanted warranties up about your sink coatings. They buy it, for example, in Gauteng, but then they sent it over to the coast, one kilometer from the high water mark. And then they wanted to use a Z200 or a Z275 coating. And then expecting it to, to last longer than 10 years. Um, if you look at this as table, you will see that there's really, um, if you go out at the highest, let's say, tempo, um, a 19 micron coating, for example, will last barely two to three years. So um, that's why it's very important to check where, where you will be using the material. If you look then at galvanized coatings or uh, galvanized material, and you want to extend the lifetime, you want actually to increase the protection. Then you have to start looking at duplex systems, uh, systems with a paint uh, ex extends the lifetime of all of these products quite uh, significantly. And um, for example, a painted product, let's say for a normal area that you would use in inland sea free areas where you want, uh, you know, not in excessive corrosive areas, you will have a painted product with a, a zinc coating of Z200, 14 microns per site. You have then a pretreatment, a certain 
thickness of primer and a top coat with a single backing coat. And this will give you a life thumbs up to 20 years um, in a normal urban, say, sea-free environment, and even um, longer than 30 years in some of very dry environments where you don't have a lot of pollutants in the, in the air. Otherwise, if you want um, something that gives you more protection when you are in an aggressive area like in the coast, um, you have an op option of the chromatic gluten, for example, a color product where you have a uh, base steel with thick, uh, uh, thicker zinc coating, as it's said to some five, you have a pre-treatment and then also a thicker primer than a normal uh, paint coated steel chromatic with the normal top coat. This combination, this system at the back, also a, a thicker primer than the normal chromatic. This all combination of the zinc material plus your color material, this is what gives you the longer lifetime. This form a barrier and a resistance for the material um, to corrode. If you look at the, the pre-painted steel, it's uh, typically composed of, of layers, as we said, the metallic coating. Surface treatment is very important. This is what assists with the adherence of uh, the primer and the top coat to the steel, to the galvanized steel. Uh, this is very important to have a very tight uh, material that you uh, don't allow uh, the contaminants or the, let's say, for example, liquids or things like that really to reach as easily the surface of the steel. Um, it's also, uh, Good to know that uh, galvanized products, especially zinc coated, uh, normally more the more zinc basic um, galvanized products, have a very good edge protection. So, uh, because the zinc sacrifice itself uh, preferentially, as we mentioned, so when you do um, roof sheetings and you have sometimes have to cut and so on, um, you can know that the edges are protected by the zinc. Also, what is important to know that is our uh, color material is uh, also uh, green. So it's chrome free on galvanized materials, one of the um, only uh, products that you can have a full chrome free primer and also a chrome free um, surface treatment. And then to assist also with, uh, for longer lifetimes and then some of certain of the darker colors have also eat reflective pigments that helps to um, keep the material cooler and to also then lead to less fading and less um, and enhance the lifetime of the products. Here you will see compared to the previous, um, previous table that we had the lifetime of pure of only zinc coatings, spare zinc coatings, let's say, and compared to a duplex system, you can have the normal chromatic that is set to 200 coating. And you can see that you can have now up to 20 years lifetime in, in, in a sea free areas and so on. So this product is recommended for bigger than five kilometers from the bywater water mark or on the um, thicker gulf coating with the thicker uh, primer and so on, you can have lifetime year of 15 years from 400 meters from the coast and up, up to 30 years. So that is the, the, the benefits of having a duplex system based on galvanized um, substrate. Very important as well, when you're specifying or when buying is um, at looking at the source of the material, let's say, not mixing materials, uh, mixing maybe inferior substandard coatings um, and, and less coating weights with normal material. You can see here in this example, uh, some issues that we had with people buying uh, and mixing materials on roofs, where you would have maybe a, a product, like a chromatic that is suitable for the South African environment with the high UV radiation and with some maybe uh, imported products or uh, that is not really targeted for the South African environment in coatings. 
uh, we have had various questions and recently, and I think uh, after COVID and so on, there was a, a big, let's say, intake of, of imported material in South Africa. And um, we had various questions about customers finding themselves in this specific uh, situation where material was mixed in their buildings and now they are sitting with the problems. So um, it's a, you can always look at um, that uh, your material that you're using uh, from brand, brands that you trust, that it is branded, that it specifies what the material it is, um, your thicknesses, your coating and your full traceability so that you can be ensured um, that the products that you buy that will comply with, with that, what you expect it to last. Um, very important as well is um, to use the correct uh, type of fasteners uh, for your product, for your area. Um, you can see here an example of where incorrect fasteners were used and then it mars the whole um, aesthetic view of your material. Uh, there's also the sources of premature failing in, in those areas where you, if you, the wrong fasteners were used. So typically ordinary class three um, fasteners is uh, recommended for inland areas and class four fasteners for coastal and industrial areas. So what is the feature that makes uh, Galvanized material, continuous galvanized material as well. Um, preferred material for roofing and cladding. Uh, it's fully recyclable, scrum free. It gives you good corrosion protection. It is a good improved edge protection, and you have a predictable life cycle per region. So when you use uh, galvanized material, you can say you can predict. Um, when it will, how long it will last, when you will have to do maintenance, and um, you, do, you don't get caught by surprises if following all the guidelines for the correct regions to use it. Uh, galvanized steel or steel as well is lightweight. Um, it is very versatile. You can use it uh, in a lot of applications. You have flexible, you have modern roofing designs. Uh, you, you know, it's not, uh, you are not only limited to a normal uh, type of the science and you, you can really be creative with that. Um, also, when you start looking at color coated materials, it's a nice aesthetic appeal. You have a variety of colors that you can use and different colors, uh, gloss, especially also later, um, more modern coatings start having also surface textures or things like that. So really one can do a lot uh, with this type of materials. Good resistance to ultraviolet for against fading and also thermal efficiency where certain of the uh, dark colors when we have cool pigments where it can then uh, keep your roof a little bit um, cooler and then and then it. So um, all in all, Galvanized, continuous galvanizing steel um, is a very, let's say, benef uh, it's a very good product to have um, different applications. Um, also, uh, something that um, one can use with confidence in different areas. So um, thank you. That's just my my last slide. <laughs> thank you very much, Mariana. Um, I'm just going to quickly stop sharing your screen. Yes. There we go. Thanks so much for that, Mariana. I found that very um, very interesting. Um, it's been so interesting to learn about galvanized coated steel. Uh, sheet for construction specifically. If anyone would like to be in touch with any of our speakers, please be sure to leave your details in the chat so we can respond to you after the session. Right, we're going to move now to our Q&A. I see we do have um, a few questions coming through. I see Simon has answered some of them, but I'm going to ask them um, for the rest of our 
um, attendees. So the first question we've got here is um, somebody asked, can you tell me which African countries have the best zinc deposits? Um, Simon, would you like to take that one? Yes, good afternoon. Um, I don't know the uh, zinc deposit geology of the whole of Africa, but I can tell you that Namibia has got, has got rich zinc deposits in southern Namibia. There are probably other unexplored deposits. South Africa itself has got extraordinarily rich deposits. Um, around the area in Black Mountain in the Northern Cape, Vedanta mines at a mine called Hamsburg, um, it's a quite an unusual geological, um, I wouldn't call it a fault, it's, a, it's actually a mountain um, with a very unusual structure and that's rich in, in, in zinc and other associated minerals. And then further away in Prisca, um, Orion Minerals have reopened an Anglo-American mine that's 29 years old and that mine is very rich in zinc and copper all of which are now valuable for batteries, zinc batteries for zinc oxide, for zinc oxide batteries and copper for copper cables for battery driven motor vehicles. Um, I'm not aware of other, it could be, it's possible that Morocco and Algeria have got rich deposits, possibly Libya. And it's very likely that West Africa has also got, um, and the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has probably got rich, it's certainly got rich cobalt, um, and rare earth deposits, it's probably got zinc as well. So you'll probably find that people will go there if logistically they can go there and if uh, bureaucratically they can get in there and people, of course, are already mining there and has been going on for a long time. But direct answer on that, I don't know for the rest, but I do know South Africa and Namibia, very rich. Africa coming to the party again. Um, another question we've got is, what specification, this comes from Gerard Kortfitter, and he asks, what specification do you recommend for repair of damage to the high, for, to the hot dip galvanizing of, say, a steel brace, which might, must be cut and welded, but it can't go back for re-galvanizing or be replaced because of availability or time constraints? Simon, would you like to take that? It is also should comment on this as well. I did write to Gerard and say that <clears throat> if it's in situ, he's got a number of options. He can either, first he needs to clear up and clean up, and if he's welded, he'll have damaged the existing galvanizing. So he needs to clean the whole surface first, and then he can either apply, if it's a small piece of damage, um, packs that Terry will speak about called Zinc Fix, and there's another pack as well. They, they are two-pack epoxy coatings that are applied at about 100 microns dry film thickness, or DFT, the other alternative is if it's bigger damage, he can apply a zinc thermal spray. Um, and there are people who do that in South Africa. And the third option is to use either inorganic or organic zinc rich paints. Um, and those, the inorganic zinc rich paints are very, very good, but you've got to apply them very carefully and you've got to know exactly what you're doing. Otherwise, you will have a mess. Um, the organic zinc rich paints are more forgiving, um, but the underlying basic, if you apply an inorganic zinc rich paint, you will get a superb coating, but then you've got to choose the next coating layers very, very carefully. But Terry, you've got long knowledge of this, so it's over to you. Yeah, if I can just say, um, be very careful of the choice that you have. Um, most contractors will use a zinc rich paint in a spray can. Um, even though sometimes it says uh, 94 on the surface of the can, um, it doesn't refer to um, zinc content. It refers to the quality of the zinc, um, but the content is about 40%. So, so we uh, developed, uh, we found that the two packs were considerably better. Why? Because they could achieve 100 microns in a single application. And for that reason, uh, the the products were packed into little squish packs. And as Simon mentioned, um, Zinc Fix is one uh, a proprietary name and the other one is called Galf Patch. And those both are available um, either from the Hot Tip Galvanizers Association or myself um, or otherwise um, um, the, the manufacturers of those products, which is Speckcoats 
and uh, spray flow. Um, so yeah, there's full information that's available, but be careful of the spray cans because the spray can also gives a very silver looking uh, finish, which ideally looks the same as the galvanizing right initially, but ultimately um, as the zinc carbonate form, which is a darker color, starts um, um, uh, growing, and uh, which is a dark color, and uh, that zinc uh, paint starts standing out like a sore thumb. Whereas the two products that I mentioned are being designed to actually be very similar to the product that um, the galvanized coating in the zinc carbonate form form. Thanks very much for that, Terry. Um, I see the answers of the questions are coming in th thick and fast now, so I'll just go um, from the top. Um, another question we've got is, how does zinc anodes protect a ship hull in seawater? What's the difference with hot dip galvanizing? Maybe Terry, you can answer that one as well. Yeah, and look, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the cathodic protection that uh, a zinc anode would give you on a ship's hull is much the same as the protection that a zinc coating, um, when it gets damaged onto a piece of steel like we've talked about, a very similar reaction. Obviously, the anodes have to be designed according to the area that it can protect. And um, uh, maybe Simon can mention one or two things that he knows about that in, in, in addition to what I've just told you. Um, you have to be very careful how you carry out work on ship's hulls. <clears throat> um, firstly, if the ship's got its own internal cathodic protection system, it will have a series of, of, of reference electrodes around the hull. And then there'll be electronic controls that measure the requirement of current for the hull. Um, when you apply a zinc anode, um, you firstly have to choose the zinc that has a very low iron content and you have to have it analyzed. Secondly, there are other anodes available, depending on whether the vessel is going to be moving in estuaries or river water, or whether it's going to be in seawater. Um, there are calculations that can be done using zinc to determine the current that the zinc anode will provide. This is provided there isn't a cathodic protection system built into the vessel. If there's a cathodic protection system built into the vessel, then you have to be very careful that how you install the anodes and what you're actually doing. Um, I'm not sure what the questioner, where they're going to apply them. Sometimes you don't, if there's no cathodic protection system, you would apply it um, on rudders, um, on other fittings under the hull, um, and obviously monitor it and you need to make sure that you've got the right mass of zinc in your anode, the right purity. Um, so there are quite a few parameters that go into it. Um, if the person concerned wants more detail, then they'll have to contact us. Or ask another question now and focus it more accurately so we can give you a better answer. Uh, while we perhaps wait for that other question, I'm going to move on to um, another question we've got here. What are the current maximum bath sizes available? What is the risk of warping due to galvanizing? And what are the correct protection methods? Simon? Uh, Terry, I think that's your, what did you say? What is, could you just repeat the question? Sure. What are the current maximum bath sizes available? What bath, is the what? risk? Sorry? Maximum what sizes? Bath. Bath sizes. Oh, I think you're talking about galvanizing going. kettles. They're called kettles. Yes. Oh, there okay. we go. Material. And then what's the risk of warping due to galvanizing and what are the correct protection methods? It's over to you, Terry. Okay, yes. Um, look, currently, uh, the, the longest bars in South Africa are around about 15 meters. There are, they are um, definitely two up in Johannesburg. I know the one is very much in business. I'm not quite sure the other one. Uh, down and in Cape Town, there are uh, currently is one 14 meter kettle, which is about three meters deep. Um, uh, and I know that in about uh, three or four months' time, there will be a further one that's also 40 meters. They they range about one and a half meters wide and up to three to three and a half meters deep. So it's a huge investment in terms of zinc, especially when you think of the zinc costs in around about 70,000 rand a ton, and there's seven tons in a cubic meter. So you can just work out the cost of that. So um, from a warping perspective, obviously, um, single um, uh, taking items into the bath, um, ideally at the right size for that bath size, 
is probably the best way. If the item is too long or too deep, you will have to incur a double dipping sequence. Um, and that double dipping or double end dipping uh, has a consequence of possible warping. There are procedures that one can do. We, we've done before, we've done crane girders, which are 18 meters long and on a 14 meter kettle. Um, and um, with the right procedures afterwards, uh, slow cooling down, we've eliminated the warping. So uh, speak to the galvanizers or talk to us if you have those concerns prior to going into uh, putting in. Otherwise, make it modular sizes, which I was going to get to in my three slides that I missed because of time constraints. But if you look at the Athlone Stadium down here in Cape Town, uh, that, uh, those two arches were hot tip galvanized. They were done in a very different way. Um, and uh, there was no warping whatsoever because we actually created a bit of uh, innovation when we were galvanizing uh, the uh, separate tubes. Thanks very much, Terry. Um, that seems to be all the questions that have come through for the time being. Um, I think we, I'm just being conscious of time now, so I think I'm going to end off the Q&A. Um, but before I um, end off the proceedings, um, I'd like to hand back over to Simon Norton for some closing remarks. Um, yes, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Mariana from Oslo Metal. Thank you, Terry Smith, independent consultant. Um, listeners and those who are joining us on this presentation, um, we uh, had so much to tell you. Terry's brain is bulging out of his head. Mariana's brain is doing the same. And we probably have to have another seminar, which we might well do on this topic to give more time to look at some cases. However, fire us emails and we'll be able to assist you. There are two things I want to mention. Firstly, we published, Terry and I published in 2020, a, a book called Essentials of Galvanizing. We have physical copies of those available, which we can post to you. They are extremely useful to have on your shelf. We have it electronically as well. Secondly, we have another publication called A Rapid Guide to Galvanizing, which we can also email to you. We haven't printed it, but we could if you wanted to. Um, we, and we'll also be having another webinar on zinc and engineering, which Shannon will talk about in a minute. Um, so there are lots of materials and lots of resources available to you. If you're a bit shy to ask questions on this webinar, don't be shy to send us an email and ask us to get involved in your project because it's better to galvanize than to feel sorry afterwards when it's all rusting and corroding and you've then got to go and do all sorts of complex things to fix it up. On the continuous galvanizing front, I want to actually say to you that there's a huge resource available with Mariana and her team at ArcelorMittal. There are other people who make continuous galvanized coated material and continuous material that's not coated. They also have expertise. Uh, Deferco and Soldana Bay have done have material which is not coated. They make specialized uh, galvanized sheeting. But remember, when you specify and utilize that in corrosive environments at the coast or in corrosive areas, talk to us first rather than put it in and then find afterwards that tears and crying start. Um, Arcelor Metal, for argument's sake, has got, I've seen many materials, people have used Chromadec in areas right up against the coast when they in fact should be using Chromadec Ultim. Um, you need to very carefully design. We always hate to do failure investigations when we could have done it at the design stage. So the IZA is there not only to promote the use of zinc in continuous galvanizing, Mariana's field, Terry's hot tip galvanizing and other material, but also in areas like medicine, drugs, um, fertilizer in South Africa. Um, and, there, and we have a huge base of expertise overseas on sustainability. Very few people know that zinc is used in tires in the vulcanizing process. So if there's anybody connected to the tire industry, we have a whole lot of expertise there. So keep watching the space. More is going to come out. We also have email as we're doing. And um, Shannon will speak about our next uh, forthcoming uh, webinar. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to the South African Institute of Marine Engineers and Naval Architects, um, to um, Admiral Watson for the CPD points. And as I said to you before, if you've got questions, please ask. Don't be shy. We can help you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. 
And as I mentioned, that does bring us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our panelists, Simon Norton, Terry Smith, and Mariana DeBrain. Also a special thanks to Kevin Watson from the South African Institute of Marine Engineers and Naval Architects for arranging the CPD points. Please do remember to send us your EXA registration number if you haven't already done so. Thank you so much to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this specialist workshop on zinc in construction and building. If you'd like more information, please be sure to visit the International Zinc Association's website at www.africa.zinc.org. And as Simon mentioned, if you would like an electronic copy of the Essentials of Galvanizing booklet, you can send us an email at shannon at creamamedia.co.za, and a PDF was also shared in the chat for you to download. Now, the next webinar from the IZAIDS Africa Desk is taking place on the 20th of July, 2022. That webinar will focus on zinc in engineering, focusing on thermal sprayed zinc, zinc rich paints and rebar. The registration link for that event has been shared in the chat and we'll also send it to you in a follow up email. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, as Simon said, please do be in touch with us. We thank you so much for your time. Remember to specify zinc, stay well and goodbye.